Hello, everybody. Welcome. We are going to go ahead and get going now. I am Shane Crotty, and, <clears throat> and we are um, here today to do our, our live from the lab uh, with a focus on, on vaccination against heart disease. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I um, am part of the leadership here at, at LJI. I'm a professor and, and chief scientific officer. Um, and just want to thank everybody for uh, uh, joining us today and, and your, your support, um, particularly a number of our, our, our board members, um, Tom Telly, Barbara Donnell, Renata Haas, John Major, uh, Bart Cohen, uh, Mark Waxman, and we're really uh, thankful to have such an involved board as you will see throughout the, the course of, of this. And I've got joining me today, um, the, uh, the primary speaker, Felix uh, Nettersheim, who's gonna be talking about his research and, and the funding that he's received through uh, the, the Tule and Ricky Family Spark program, as well as uh, Semra Shehik, um, who's, who's a member of our, our flow core, which I'll tell you a little more about. Um, and uh, much of this work has been made uh, possible by, by the SPARK program, which you'll be hearing some more about. And so we're really thankful for both the, the Tully families and uh, Tully family and the Ricky family for, uh, for funding these programs um, and, and really getting these, these young scientists this, uh, this extra launching point. Um, <clears throat> Also thanks to John and Sue Major um, uh, for their funding of our LJI Center for Clinical Investigation, um, which is the source of some of the, the human samples uh, that go into this project and, and the flow core, which you'll hear some more about. Um, so our outline today, um, I'm gonna, uh, the way this is going to go, I'm going to give you a little bit of info about LJI for those of you who aren't um, familiar. Um, welcome, if you're not familiar with LJI. Then I'll introduce Felix. Felix will uh, tell you about his exciting work on, on the possibility of vaccinating against heart disease, um, which, uh, again, is being funded by uh, a SPARK program award. <clears throat> As part of that, um, give you a little more insight into how research goes on here. Uh, he's going to uh, introduce and, and transition over to Semra, who's going to tell you some more about how the, the flow cytometry core actually works here um, and, and really how incredible that, uh, that technology is. <clears throat> um, uh, and then after his talk, after those two talks, we'll come back for, for some Q&A, okay? Um, and in terms of the, the flow core, um, actually, I'll come back to it in just a, in, in just a minute. Um, I'll do that actually as part of this overall introduction. Um, <clears throat> so Felix is going to um, be talking on, on this project. Um, and... Again, for, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, we are the La Jolla Institute for Immunology. We're a, a nonprofit research institute um, located on the, the UC San Diego campus. We're one of the uh, top research institutes in the whole world. Um, where, and we, we study the immune system to, to both treat and, and prevent diseases, which is uh, quite a, a challenging task because the immune system is incredibly uh, incredibly complex. And then so to accomplish these goals, we have diverse research programs um, studying uh, different cell types of the immune system, different uh, molecular biology of the immune system and different disease processes in the immune system. And actually the, the live from the lab presentation today, which is our first for, for the SPARC program, um, is really a great example of, of the types of, of innovative research that go on here. Um, LJI has been around, just uh, a few stats, LJI has been around for over 35 years. We have um, 
uh, over 20 uh, labs, 20 different faculty members, and, and over 20 board members. Um, <clears throat> uh, Felix uh, is a postdoctoral researcher here, and he's one of quite a few postdocs here. Um, and we have often been ranked as, as one of the best places in San Diego, in the country, and the world um, for both to work and, and to train as a scientist. And, and I think uh, Felix is a great example um, of that. Our, our faculty are very scientifically successful by uh, a variety of metrics, and, and one is um, the, the funding that they're able to uh, achieve um, based on, on review by, by peers in, in, in their scientific community. Here are our faculty um, <clears throat> working in quite a different range of areas um, of the immune system, overall led by Erica Sapphire, uh, president and, uh, and CEO. <clears throat> and most of that research clusters into four major research areas. Um, we have uh, fantastic expertise in vaccines and infectious diseases, and so we have a Center for Vaccine Innovation. Um, uh, there are exceptional differences um, between uh, uh, men and women and some immune responses, and so we have a new center for uh, really trying to understand those sex-based differences in, in the immune system. We have a fantastic center for cancer immunotherapy and a center for autoimmunity inflammation, and really our topic today is, is, is central in, in, in this area, which will be explained over time. A couple other um, uh, general factoids about the Institute in terms of how we transition these basic science findings into uh, cures and, and therapies. We have many licensing agreements and patents and uh, uh, drugs that have been uh, moved on into clinical trials. <clears throat> um, and we're very well known uh, publicly for our scientific discoveries, um, which has been noted in, in all of these uh, uh, publications. Um, uh, and our young scientists uh, are also uh, fantastic. Um, and we have this uh, fantastic SPARK program, um, these uh, Tuli and Ricky Family SPARK Awards for Innovations in, in Immunology that go to young scientists at uh, LJI for innovative research. Here are the six uh, award winners in, in 2023. And so we're really happy to highlight one of those projects uh, today, um, which will be uh, given by uh, Felix Nettersheim. <clears throat> and so Felix um, is a postdoc at, at LJI and uh, has done his training. Um, so he's an MD. Uh, he did his clinical training in Germany um, and he did uh, his scientific training here with uh, Dr. Klaus Ley, um, who's one of the foremost leaders in, in the world in, in vascular biology and immunology, um, and who's recently moved on to be the co-director um, of the uh, Immunology Center at the Medical College of, of Georgia. Um, and uh, Felix and, and uh, the Ley Lab um, have been really trying to understand cardiovascular immunology and obviously Felix will tell you a, a lot more about this but he's going to discuss novel therapeutic strategies um, to potentially vaccinate against uh, heart disease um, because um, heart disease is a, a leading cause of death in the United States for for decades um, and interestingly it's been well known for a while that, that heart disease, atherosclerosis, actually involves the immune system. It's not simply about um, the, uh, the, the vessels and, uh, and uh, the muscle cells of, of the heart. And, and uh, Felix is going to uh, explain to you a lot more of that biology and, and how um, he might be able to tweak the immunology to uh, have much better outcomes in people. Um, and then, oh, no, and then I jumped over the, uh, the, the flow core part, sorry. Um, so we're very proud of our flow core. It's one of the best flow cytometry facilities in the world. Um, it allows us to do extraordinary things looking at 
single cells of the immune system at thousands of cells per second. Um, and that helps facilitate research by Felix and me and many other people here. And so you'll get a more direct taste of that a little later. All right, with that, Felix, I will hand it over to you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, Shane, for that kind of introduction. Um, and yeah, thanks everyone, of course, for having me today. I'm uh, super excited to give an overview uh, about our ongoing research towards the development of a heart disease vaccine. Let me first uh, share my screen. And um, to start, I will give a brief introduction to heart disease and why we actually need uh, novel uh, treatment options. So heart disease or cardiovascular disease are very general terms that basically include all conditions related to the heart or the circulatory system. In a narrower sense, these terms are often referred to pathologies related to a condition called atherosclerosis, which is by far the most uh, common underlying cause for these diseases. Atherosclerosis describes a process in which fatty plaques build up in our arteries that can progressively grow and cause narrowing uh, of those blood vessels. More critically, these plaques can become unstable, can rupture and cause formation of a blood clot that totally blocks the blood flow. Atherosclerosis can happen anywhere in the body, but two of the most commonly affected regions are the arteries supplying our heart muscle, called the coronary arteries, and the arteries supplying our brain. And an acute blockage of those arteries causes heart attack uh, or stroke, in which the respective parts of the heart muscle or the brain are not supplied with blood anymore, and if the vessel is not reopened immediately, the tissue is irreversibly damaged. In the middle of the past century, when the incidence of heart disease was increasing and there weren't really treatments available, the Framingham Heart Study was initiated with the goal to identify risk factors that contribute to the development of heart disease. And this study that included more than 5,000 patients uh, participants in its first uh, cohort, and it's still ongoing, has been one of the most impactful cardiovascular studies so far that essentially revealed that high cholesterol, high blood pressure, smoking, obesity, and diabetes critically contribute to the development of heart disease. These now often called traditional risk factors have enabled the development of many very effective prevention and treatment strategies, such as statins and several other drugs that you might know. And collectively, these uh, strategies have enabled a very remarkable decrease in heart disease-related mortality of more than 70% over the past few decades. However, despite this very fortunate development, heart disease remains a very prevalent condition, affecting one in 20 adults in the United States and representing the most common cause of death in the US and worldwide, killing millions of people every year. In addition to that, the development over the past decade has been somewhat concerning because as you can see here, the positive trends of the years before could not really be continued. And one reason for this might be that we were not really able to improve risk factor control anymore. As you can see on that slide, the study including almost 13,000 adults, young adults, that showed that we were only able to reduce the prevalence of hyperlipidemia, whereas the other four major risk factors, hypertension, uh, obesity, diabetes, smoking history, either remained unchanged or even increased. And that's important. So a large epidemiological study published last year that included one and a half million participants from more than 100 court studies could show that the insufficient control of these modifiable risk factors accounts for around 50% of the cardiovascular disease burden in the US and worldwide. And that's really important because what that means is that just by improving control of these risk factors, the prevalence of heart disease can be halved. So that remains a major challenge in modern medicine. However, what the data also implicates is that we critically need better novel treatment options to target the residual risk, which is also almost 50%. And the next slides nicely demonstrate why this is important to all of us. Here you can see that a middle-aged person that has none of the aforementioned risk factors, so that lives a very healthy lifestyle, still faces a 30 to 40% risk of getting significant heart disease throughout their life. So a very 
a significant amount. And we know that a critical factor contributing to that residual risk is an uncontrolled immune response causing inflammation in our vessel walls that promote the growth and eventually the destabilization of blocks. The idea that inflammation plays a role in heart disease is actually not new. In fact, the pathologist Rudolf Wischer was able already 100, more than 160 years ago to detect immune cells in a thyroid plaques. And by that time, he already claimed that a thyroid is an inflammatory disease. However, the subsequent discovery of the important role of cholesterol in mediating uh, heart disease caused that his very advanced ideas were kind of neglected for more than a century. But when the scientific community started to realize that controlling the traditional risk factors alone is not enough, the focus changed back to a research on inflammation again. And in the past two decades of the past century, a lot of evidence was provided uh, to support this, which eventually accumulated in the publication of a seminal paper by the famous US pathologist Russell Ross, in which he stated again that yes, Virgil was right, atherosclerosis is an inflammatory disease. In subsequent years, the cardiologist Paul Ritka was then able to provide considerable clinical evidence for the role of inflammation in heart disease. And what he did is he used a high sensitivity assay and could show that very slight increases of a protein called C-reactive protein, a blood marker that we use in the clinic to determine if someone has an infection, that very slight increases of that protein predict the risk of cardiovascular events. As you can see here, the study including almost 30,000 participants, and those with the highest CRP levels had a three times higher risk of getting a heart attack compared those to those with the lowest levels. And the same applied uh, to the cardiovascular risk, uh, sorry, the cardiovascular death risk. And importantly, what this figure shows, the predictive power of this inflammatory marker of CRP was much higher than that of cholesterol, which kind of supports how important uh, inflammation is. CRP is a protein that is produced by the liver upon an inflammatory uh, response. And a major pathway kind of stimulating its secretion is called the NLRP3 inflammasome pathway, which includes two major signaling molecules called IL, interleukin-1 beta, and interleukin-6. And in order to, to test whether inflammation is not only associated with heart disease, but is causally involved in its development, Ritka and colleagues initiated a trial called the CANTOS trial in which they blocked IL-1 beta with an antibody called canakinumab to see if this would really be able to reduce the progression of heart disease. This trial in which around 10,000 high-risk patients were randomized to a therapy with placebo or this antibody was groundbreaking because for the very first time it could show that an anti-inflammatory treatment is indeed able to reduce cardiovascular events. However, the effect was quite modest, as you can see here. Almost 200 patients had to be treated for five years in order to prevent one single event. And in addition to that, the therapy was associated with a significantly increased risk of getting an infection and more importantly, a fatal infection. Also, it was super expensive, costing more than 70,000 US dollars per year, which is why this therapy eventually disqualified for further development as a therapy for heart disease. Another drug that was investigated as a heart disease treatment is called colchicine. And colchicine is interesting because it's a naturally occurring substance that can be extracted from a plant called the autumn crocus and has been used as a therapy for gout since ancient times. Colchicine is known to have very broad anti-inflammatory properties, including an inhibition of the inflammasome pathway that I've shown you before. And so far, five clinical studies could robustly demonstrate that this drug is also capable to enable a very significant reduction in cardiovascular events, heart attacks, and strokes, which eventually led to its FDA approval last year. However, similar to canakinumab, colchicine was also associated with an increased risk of pneumonia and infection. At least in one of the trials, this was significant. And it's also associated with very severe gastrointestinal symptoms in every 10 patient. So that we can conclude, it's quite good that we now have an option to target the inflammatory risk, but colchicine is definitely far from perfect. So how should a perfect therapy 
to target the inflammatory risk in heart disease look like? Well, such a therapy should ideally not interfere with the capability of the immune system to fight infections or to fight cancer, but it should specifically target the part of the immune system that fights self. And maybe the most specific way to modulate immune response, to modulate the immune system, is vaccination. The concept of vaccination originated as a preventive strategy for the smallpox disease that many of you might know, a highly contagious, devastating viral disease that was one of the leading causes of death in Europe in the 18th century, causing 400,000 deaths every year. And according to history books, already in the 16th century, people in Asia started to perform a practice called inoculation, in which they took infectious material from an infected patient and exposed a healthy person to that material in order to induce a mild infection, but prevent them from getting the natural disease later on. And this strategy was quite effective because the death rate was only 2 to 3% compared to 30% when getting the natural disease, tenfold decrease. However, it's quite clear that the death rate of 2 to 3% would be absolutely unacceptable in modern times. So fortunately, in the end of the 18th century, the English physician Edward Jenner observed that milkmaids um, infected with the cowpox virus were protected from subsequently getting the smallpox disease. And this was important because the cowpox disease caused much milder symptoms than smallpox. So mainly caused local skin symptoms, maybe some mild systemic reactions, but was not associated with the same high mortality. And in order to prove this observation, he took infectious material from the skin lesion of a local milkmaid and inoculated an eight-year-old boy. And then he could show that a couple of weeks later, when he exposed that boy to smallpox, he was indeed protected. He confirmed this in a series of patients. And although there was initially quite some skepticism, he was eventually able to publish his data and to convince the scientific community of this important uh, strategy. And although history books say Jenner was most likely not the first one having this idea or even practicing this, he was eventually the one to provide scientific evidence and to convince the world. And that's why he's kind of suggested to be the inventor of the vaccine. And as you all might know, smallpox was eventually eradicated in 1980. And when we consider that this disease is assumed to have killed 500 million people in the past 100 years of its existence, it's without any doubt that vaccination has been one of the most impactful advancements in uh, human medicine. So how does this idea translate to heart disease? I think to understand, we firstly need to get a little bit of understanding on how vaccination works. And this slide will give, will give a kind of simplified, broad overview uh, about uh, the concept of vaccination. So usually a vaccine contains a vaccine antigen, which can, which can be a whole pathogen, which is killed or inactivated, can be part of a pathogen. And it also contains a substance called an adjuvant, which is needed to induce a local immune response, to kind of tell the immune system, you have to react right now. There's something going on here. What then happens is that an, a so-called antigen presenting cell takes up the vaccine antigen and shreds it down to very little pieces that we call peptides or epitopes, loads them on certain type of receptors, and transport these receptors on their cell surfaces to kind of present the antigen. The antigen presenting cell then moves into a local lymph node. And in these lymph nodes, there are lots of T cells. T cells are another type of immune cells that are characterized by the expression of a very specific receptor on the cell surface called a T cell receptor. And this T cell receptor is highly specific for one given antigen called the cognate antigen for the T cell. And the good thing is, we have millions of those T cells. So there's always be a T cell around that will respond to an antigen right. presented by an antigen presenting cell. And when the T cell kind of meets the cell, it will becomes it will be activated and differentiate into a very specialized type of T cell. We broadly distinguish two types of T cells. One is called a killer T cell. And as the name suggests, this T cell has the capability to directly kill an infected cell. The other one's called the helper T cell, which has the job to help another immune cell type called the B cell to multiply and to differentiate into a very specific, very specialized cell type making highly powerful, highly specific antibodies uh, targeting the pathogen. So in conclusion, the vaccination kind of prepares our immune system for a specific pathogen 
helps the immune system to make very powerful, very specific cells that when we encounter that pathogen on a natural way, these cells can very quickly kill that pathogen before it can infect a lot of cells and cause symptoms. So how does this idea now translate to heart disease? So it all started in the 1980s when the lab of Gordon Hansen and Lena Jonasson were among the first to reveal that um, the immune cells infiltrating our plugs that Virchow had already discovered years before contain a significant amount of T cells. And importantly, they could show that these T cells show strong signs of activation, which means that they must have recently encountered their cognitive antigens. And since it was known by that time that the plugs are full with cholesterol and that the cholesterol in the plugs is often chemically modified, we call it oxidized, they suspected that these T cells might have responded to oxidized cholesterol, which they then tested experimentally. So what they did is they took plug T cells, incubated them with antigen presenting cells that I've just shown you, and oxidized cholesterol. And they could show that this induces a very strong T cell activation. That was not the case when any of these components were missing or when the antigen presenting receptor was blocked with an antibody. So in other words, they could provide evidence that T cells in the plugs kind of respond to oxidized cholesterol. So the question was now, do these T cells play a role in the progression of heart disease? Are they causally involved in it? And to test that hypothesis, um, the group of Joseph Whitstam here at UCSD San Diego was among the first to vaccinate experimental animals with oxidized cholesterol. And the hypothesis was, of course, if we do a vaccination, we should induce that T cell response. So we should probably make heart disease getting worse. But to their surprise, the opposite was the case. Heart disease was reduced. 30% less plugs in these animals, a very remarkable decrease. And importantly, that early finding was subsequently confirmed in a variety of different studies. And this slide should just give an overview. Please don't try to read the details. But what it shows is that there are many studies using, using different antigens, using different adjuvants, different uh, rounds of, of administering the vaccine, different animal models. And these studies could all show that a vaccine with cholesterol-related uh, antigens has a very protective effect in heart disease. And my PI, Professor Klaus Ley uh, and his team, um, were kind of able or like were kind of instrumental in understanding um, the mechanism by which the vaccine protects some heart disease. And I have to say that I'm very thankful that I could join this team and work on this very fascinating approach, I think. And one um, very important finding they have made is that the T cells do not only respond to cholesterol when it's oxidized, when it's modified, but actually already respond to native cholesterol present in all of our bodies. In particular, the T cells were shown to respond to the core protein of cholesterol, which we call ApoB, or more specifically, ApoB peptides. Mm. And with the help of Professor Alex Hette here at LGI, that as many of you know, is one of the world's leading experts in discovering the antigens, it's discovering the epitopes that T cells respond to, the Lay Lab was able to identify um, the peptides that T cells respond to in ApoB in mice and in humans. And this was very important because it then enabled further studies on these T cells, studies to look. Yeah, to see how these T cells look like, how they behave, uh, etc. And what those experiments were able to show is that actually every one of us, even a healthy, healthy person that has no heart disease, already has T cells in their blood that respond to ApoB, that respond to cholesterol. But importantly, the majority of these cells are so-called regulatory T cells, a very important T cell type that has kind of the job to suppress inflammatory responses and to suppress autoimmune responses in particular. So it kind of uh, is a T cell type that prevents that our immune system attacks our body's own cells if they're not infected. We also know that even a healthy person already has some effector T cells that might potentially cause an autoimmune response. But since the regulatory T cells outnumber those effector T cells, 
there's no inflammation happening in a healthy person. However, during the course of our lives, a shift can happen and the affected T cells can eventually outnumber the protective regulatory T cells, then trigger a pathogenic autoimmune response against cholesterol, and by this way, give rise to heart disease. So how can the vaccine prevent this? Well, the vaccine was shown to specifically expand the protective T cell type, the regulatory T cells. And this expansion then prevents the inflammatory response from happening and then prevents heart disease from happening. This is kind of, in a very easy way, the, the mechanism by which the vaccine was shown to, to prevent heart disease from happening. So in order to, to study um, these T cells, we do not only need to know the epitopes that they respond to, but we need certain tools in a laboratory. And a very important tool is called a tetramere, which consists of the um, receptor that the antigen-presenting cells that I've shown you before use to present an antigen to the T cell. Four of these receptors loaded uh, with the given antigen, in our case, an ApoB peptide, and then labeled with a fluorochrome, which is a substance that when excited uh, with a laser emits a certain color and can be detected. And what we can do is we can take millions of cells from, from tissues, from all, all tissues together, from blood, and can incubate them with those reagents, with those tetramers. And then they will only label the very rare population of T cells responding to our peptide to ApoB. And then we can analyze uh, these cells. And the lay lab, with the help of the great uh, core facilities here at AGI, has utilized uh, tetramers for um, yeah, many different downstream applications that are shown here on this slide. Please, again, don't um, focus on the details, just an overview of what you can do with these reagents. And these applications include large cytometry. You can do microscopy on these cells. You can do RNA sequencing, which means you can get like information about all the genes uh, that they express. You can even do RNA sequencing on a single cell on a very granular level. And you can sequence the T cell receptor of these cells, which helps to identify them more easily later on. And in addition to tetramers, another important method that we use in the laboratory is called an activation-induced marker assay. And to do this, we again need a sample, which can be blood sample or tissue sample that we dissociate to get a single cell suspension. Um, we load that suspension into a culture plate and then incubate it with a single peptide or more, more often actually with a pool of different peptides. And what then happens is that antigen presenting cells present in those wells take up the, the peptide presented on their receptors. And if there's T cells around responding to that peptide, they will be activated and upregulate certain activation markers that we can then again measure uh, with close autometry, or we can also use this to sort the cells and, 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 uh, and do any yeah, downstream analysis. It's basically the same thing that I've shown you uh, before. And uh, as Shane has already mentioned in the beginning, uh, here at AGI, we're very fortunate to have an excellent flow cytometry core, probably one of the best in the country. And I'm now very happy to hand over to my colleague, Semra, who is a specialist at our flow cytometry core, and who will now give you an introduction to uh, flow cytometry. Hi, my name is Semra, and I'm a flow cytometry specialist here at LJI. And today we're going to be working um, with r 4 x 20 which is a very powerful instrument that was kindly um, funded by the Conrad Prebys Foundation. And this instrument has five lasers that allows us to look at over 18 parameters at one time. And it uses a very high throughput method. And it can look at tens, to, tens of thousands of cells per second. Um, and um, here we have uh, loaded a plate with samples from a blood donor. And the way flow cytometry, flow cytometry works is by passing a stream of cells through a laser beam. And there are detectors within the instrument that are able to pick up on the light that is being emitted by these cells. Um, and we're able to get a lot of information from just one sample. And so while this um, 
instrument is collecting the blood from our sample, um, we can use a software that allows us to get a lot of information from the cells that the instrument is collecting. So we're able to look at everything from the size and shape of the cell to the molecules that are um, present on the cell surface. Um, and we're opening up our um, experiment here. It just takes a little bit of time for the um, instrument to show our data. Um, and here we can see the blood that was collected by the flow cytometer. And here in our first gate, we see the size and shape of our cells. And everything that's showing up here along the axis is actually debris. And everything over here to the right are our cells of interest. So I've drawn a gate here to select for our lymphocytes. And the next plot we're going to look at is our live dead staining. So everything that's fluorescing um, positive here is actually dead cells. And um, I've drawn a gate and selected for our live cells. So by doing this, we're able to really clean up the data, get rid of the dead cells, and get rid of any debris and get a really nice picture of our CD4 positive T cells. And these cells are a subset of the immune, immune cells that we are interested in looking at. And our final gate will be of our tetramer staining. And these cells here are the T cells that have been activated by cholesterol antigen. And these are the same cells that would respond to immunization. Um, and it's very cool that we're able to go from looking at 800,000 events in this first plot. And we were able to identify the 400 cells that are actually of interest to us. And it's with the help of this very powerful instrument and our amazing scientists here at LJI that we're able to um, use the tool of flow cytometry to answer immunolo immunology's toughest questions. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Netterstein. Yeah, thank you very much, Samuel, for that uh, great introduction to flow cytometry. That's uh, yeah, super interesting. As as you said, it's uh, maybe the most important method uh, for us, uh, yeah, studying the immune system. And in the remaining minutes, oh, I'm sorry, this is now going back to the first. Slide. In the remaining minutes, I would now like to um, talk a little bit about the challenges that we uh, still have to overcome in order to translate the idea of a heart disease vaccine uh, to clinical practice. And the first challenge is that we have to find the optimal epitopes. I've shown you before that we were able to, to already identify some of these uh, epitopes, the antigens that the cells respond to. But um, immunology in humans is unfortunately a little bit uh, more complex than I was able to explain in a short amount of time. And the essential, an essential thing is that basically the receptors that are needed to present these epitopes to T cells are very variable. And one person can have totally different types of receptors than another person, which means that an epitope that might work great in one person might work not that great in another person. So what we need is to find the cocktail of epitopes that induces a strong immune response in as many people as possible. The next thing is that we need to find the perfect adjuvant. In most of the animal studies, adjuvants were used that can unfortunately not be used uh, in humans. However, my colleague Koji was able to show that an adjuvant called Edavax that's already in clinical use for the flu vaccine works very well for the heart disease vaccine. So this could be an interesting uh, candidate here. Another, um, as I think, very exciting, very interesting finding was made by the group of Hugo Shahin, who is the uh, founder of BioNTech, the company that made the Pfizer uh, COVID vaccine. And what they could show is that a nanoparticle-based mRNA vaccine is very effective in treating multiple sclerosis and autoimmune disease. And although there's another disease, the mechanism is very similar to that of our heart disease vaccine, especially just another antigen. So this strategy could work very well for the heart disease vaccine, and it's, it's very interesting. 
Another point we are working on is how to perfectly select our patients. I have explained to you that we have a very simple marker to identify if someone has inflammation called CRP, but for such a specific therapy that we are trying to establish, we will need a bit more specific marker to see if a patient would actually benefit from the therapy. And my colleague Pai Roy was able to validate the AIM assay that I've just explained in humans. So that could be a really interesting, really powerful tool to help us select our patients. We then have to do some fine tuning, of course. We need to find the perfect time points to deliver the vaccine, route of administration, and how to dose it. And another very important point is that we have to make sure that the immune response that we establish, that we uh, induce with our vaccine is stable. And that's important because work of the lay lab could show that the regulatory cells, the protective cells that we induce with our vaccine can unfortunately directly convert in another cell type called an XTREC, which doesn't have the same protective properties anymore, which is more like an effector T cell and which is known to, instead of preventing from heart disease, making heart disease getting worse. And my colleague Antoine was able to identify these cells in humans and to find out what markers they express, which is really important because this will help us to further study these cells. And a major focus, a major focus of the lay lab is now to really understand what are the factors, what are the mechanisms driving this pathogenic conversion from T-Rex to X-T-Rex and to find solutions to prevent this. And one of the projects I'm working on specifically tries to understand how diet affects this conversion and how the cell's metabolism affects this conversion. As I think a very cool, very interesting um, project. And I was very fortunate that um, simultaneously to the start of this project, the AGI established its own immune and metabolism core led by Tom Riffelmacher, which is a very great help for me to kind of study, uh, study this. So another point we're working on is to make sure that the immune response that we induce with the vaccine will be strong enough. And that's also important because we have learned that the response to, an, to a heart disease vaccine, to an ApoB vaccine is much weaker than a vaccine to a pathogen, to a bacterium or to a virus. And to, in order to understand why this is, we've teamed up with the lab of Professor Chris Benedict, who is an expert in studying T cells uh, reacting to a virus called cytomegalovirus. And together with his postdoc, Simon, I studied the genes that cells reacting to CMV to that virus and cells responding to ApoB to cholesterol express. And we then kind of compared these genes. We studied these genes in order to find candidates that could be the cause of the weak response to ApoB. And we were able to identify two candidate molecules based on what we know about their biological function. We validated this finding by flow cytometry, so we can confirm that they are differentially expressed between these two cell types. And we then performed an experiment in which we vaccinated experimental animals with ApoB, with cholesterol, and blocked these two molecules with antibodies. And the result was very exciting because we could thereby highly increase the vaccine response. And I'm super, super excited, super happy to continue working on that project and trying to yeah, understand the mechanisms behind that. And if this is an idea that can be translated uh, to humans. And as Shane has already mentioned in the beginning, I was very happy to be, I'm very happy to be supported by the Spark program for this uh, particular project. And the Spark program is a, it's a very cool uh, program here at LGI that helps young researchers like me to work on a research project independently before applying for a traditional uh, grant. And this program was founded in 2017 by the Tully and Ricky families shown here on that uh, picture. And while the two families remain the major supporters of this program, they were successful in motivating more than 200 people to donate to Spark, a very great achievement. Uh, they have uh, already supported almost 50 young researchers like me. And as an RD, of course, I would like to thank everyone uh, very much for donating to Spark and I would like to uh, personally thank, uh, again, Tom and uh, Judy Tully, who's, who funded my uh, particular project. Yeah, and with that being said, I would like to thank you all very much for your attention, and now I'm happy uh, to take your questions.
That was fantastic, Felix. Um, so we, there's, <clears throat> There's a Q&A box you can send in uh, questions if you have them. Um, be happy to uh, uh, to cover those. Felix, I mean, you so you covered a lot of ground. That was a lot of interesting biology. I mean, towards the end, you, you started talking about impacts of diet on uh, disease risk. I mean, is there an expectation that diet could have an impact on the on the immunology um, of all of this? I mean, how are you thinking of all of that? Yes, so, I mean that's basically what I'm what I'm studying in my project. So we're analyzing how diet, uh, in particular, affects uh, T cells responding to to cholesterol. And um, uh, yeah, certainly the there will be there will be effects that are yeah kind of that we are studying right now. The idea is that the diet has impact on the cell's metabolism, and a lot of evidence has shown that the metabolism of T cells affects highly affects their function. So, an effector T cell that I've that I've tried to explain, which kind of is making an inflammatory response, has a very different metabolism to a regulatory T cell, which is suppressing immune responses. And that's why we think diet could make a, a difference in like you know converting one of these phenotypes to the other one. Um, yeah, and I mean, I hope that um, within the next year, I might have some more specific answers on this when we have uh, yeah finished our studies. Good. Um, and I guess connected to big picture questions again about uh, heart disease. So you went through how a lot has been learned about how there are specific risk factors. Um, so if people don't have any of those known risk factors, right, but are still at risk, such as not smoking, not obesity. Um, so where do those where do those come from? And what are those risk factors or, or how might people try and uh, deal with those? That's a very good question. And um, I mean, short answer, we don't know the full, like a number of things that will explain it with, but we know, we know of course, some factors that contribute to the residual risk. I mean, one thing I've talked about is inflammation, certainly. So um, that's why we hope to to get better treatments to reduce the inflammation. There is, of course, a genetic risk. So um, we know that people uh, whose parents have had a heart attack at young ages are at highly increased risk of developing a heart attack. And some Kind of genes have also been um, discovered that may contribute to this, although in most cases it's not really known what the genes make and kind of the mechanism is not uh, clear yet. Well, like you said, of inflammation. Course, so can you give an example? Like where might that inflammation be coming from? So again, that's probably many things. So I don't think there's a single explanation for the for the inflammatory risk. Um, certainly the traditional risk factors will have an impact on inflammation. So, you know, inflammation will not be completely dissociated from a traditional risk because we know, for example, that someone who is obese, who has high cholesterol, will have more inflammation in their bodies. But it is assumed that, as I said, even a person without having these risk factors might have an, uh, a risk of inflammation. So there might be other factors that we don't know yet that contribute to that inflammatory risk. And that's what is research trying to understand right now. What are these factors and how can we prevent them? And we've got uh, we've got the billion dollar question from uh, from from Clark Straw in the, the Q&A. What, what time frame do you believe it will take for a, for a project like this to uh, to actually develop a vaccine? Um, I mean, that's a that's a great question. And I, I mean, I would be very happy if I knew the answer, but unfortunately, I don't. So what I can say is we are at the preclinical stage of development and I've, I've tried to, to show there's certain challenges we've yet to overcome before these treatments will hopefully at some point enter clinical trials. And as you all know, clinical even the clinical trial stage takes, I mean, at least five to 10 years. It will certainly take a little bit of time until we can, you know, think about having this available for uh, as a treatment. That's great, Felix. Thanks for all of that. Um, yeah. Any uh, anything I missed? Any any final comment you want to make? <clears throat> no, I think I'm. 
And again, thank you very much for having me. I was happy to uh, present on the heart disease vaccine. Yeah, no, that was really good. I mean, obviously, as you know, it's it, it's uh, you, you did a great job talking through it because, uh, as as you know, the the clinical data and the scientific data are are quite strong that that heart disease is a disease of the immune system, and yet. Um, it's still a surprising and puzzling thing. So, so thanks for introducing that, and thanks for covering uh, the the really clever ideas that uh, that you're pursuing to try and actually do something about it. Uh, Thank you very much. I think with that, um, we will uh, start wrapping it up here. Um, so, hopefully, you can see. You know that that uh, the important impact of uh, the the research we're doing, but also the the important impact of of philanthropy of of giving for for research here at, at LJI. Um, that's really entirely the the, the source of um, of funding for these these Spark projects. Um, um, and so, you know, huge thanks to the Tully family specifically for funding this project. Um, <clears throat> and the Conrad Prebus Foundation for, for funding the purchase of that, that critical technology um, that, that was shown to you earlier. And um, Felix was talking through uh, data from, you know, from actual humans, right? From actually looking. Um, <clears throat> uh, and, and that was really made possible by, by John and Sue Major who have been, um, critical uh, long-term supporters of LJI, and they did that by 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 funding the infrastructure to build our um, uh, Center for Clinical Investigation, where we have donors come in to to donate material. So, um, if anybody out there is interested in being part of uh, this heart disease vaccine research or or anything else in the institute, please do. Um, feel free to contact Kelsey Dale um, uh, in advancement or through the contact info here. And yeah, you know, I'll say as a practicing scientist, um, really a lot of our biggest breakthrough research, a lot of our, 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 our riskiest and most exciting things um, are really only possible through uh, philanthropic donations of people with a lot of um, foresight to, to try and uh, help us make those uh uh, breakthroughs by by taking risks um, that that aren't possible through conventional funding uh, strategies, and I think we've shown over and over again that we can do really great stuff with uh, with those sources of funds. Um, <clears throat> there will be a recording of this. Um, if you uh, uh, didn't manage to memorize everything that Felix said and wanted to uh, revisit uh, any of it, uh, and again, feel free to reach out to uh, to any of us in the future. Um, uh, I think that covers it. Uh, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, have a good rest of your day.